Marriage Champions, I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer with the San Antonio Marriage Initiative. I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Willard Harley Jr. to you today. He is the author of the groundbreaking bestseller, His Needs, Her Needs, Building an Affair-Proof Marriage, which was first published in 1986. And it became the foundation not only for his marriage counseling program, but inspired marriage ministries worldwide. Dr. Harley's counseling practice has grown to become one of the largest mental health clinics in Minnesota with 32 locations involving more than 100 psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and chemical dependency counselors. He and his wife, Joyce, host a daily radio show called Marriage Builders Radio. They've been married for 58 years. Dr. Harley, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure being with you. Oh, your book really revolutionized the marriage ministry and counseling in general. The thought that people have relationship needs that their spouse can and should meet. That seems kind of commonplace now, but that was really quite revolutionary back then. Let's talk about that. Can you talk about those needs and, and what you found? Well, the thing that was controversial uh, wasn't so much the, the fact that we have needs, but more to the point that men's needs on average are different than women's needs. And so uh, if you really want to be an expert at meeting the needs of your spouse, chances are your spouse's needs won't have the same priority as your needs. And so you'll have a hard time doing that because you're so tempted to meet needs that are similar to your own. So there's there when this first came out in 1986, um, there was a great deal of emphasis on how men and women are not different. They are the same, and we should treat them the same. We should have unisex toys for children so that they grow up recognizing that they are the same. Men and women are exactly the same. And I was writing a book saying, nope, nope, nope. They're very, very different. Men and women are different in every way imaginable. And if you want to have a great marriage, you have to understand the differences because in many ways, you're married to an alien, married to somebody who has a very different brain than you've got, very different ways of thinking than you have. And you have to approach your marriage not only with a great respect for the differences that you have, but you have to approach your marriage with, a, with an understanding that there's a lot to learn, that my wife, Joyce, is not like me at all. And I have come to greatly respect her point of view, her way of looking at things. I, I view her as standing back to back with me. She views the mountains. I view the ocean. We see things differently. The question is, who's right? The answer is we're both right. We're both right. And if we understand each other that way, we can be wiser in our decisions and we can have a greater understanding of, of who we are as individuals. Well, you talk about the concept of extraordinary care for your spouse. Could you tell us what that is? I really like that when we were talking about that, that, that just being a hallmark of, of how one should treat your spouse. Yeah, basically, um, I define marriage as a relationship of extraordinary care. Um, there are many definitions of marriage. There's legal definitions, um, and there are definitions of marriage in terms of, of, of um, gender and so forth. And I make it simple. I say something that most people would agree with. Marriage is a relationship of extraordinary care. So when you marry somebody, you have agreed to care for that person in a very unusual way, making that person your highest priority. But then I go on to explain what extraordinary care actually means in practice. And there are three parts to it. The first part is that you have to make this person who you care about greatly a happy person. So one of your jobs is to using my words, meet that person's most important emotional needs. You have to do the things that make them happy and fulfilled. You are, you are their agent for happiness in their life. The second part is that you should not be their source of unhappiness. You should not do things that hurt them. 
and um, I talk about six love busters, things that people do that hurt each other in their marriage that they should avoid at all costs. And then the third part is that your decisions that you make should express your extraordinary care in that you don't want to make decisions that are not going to be in the best interest of your spouse. You want it to be something that is mutually advantageous. So those are the three parts. You meet their important emotional needs so that your spouse can be happy. You avoid doing things that make your spouse unhappy. And all of the decisions that you make are joint decisions made so that both of you can be happy together. And those are, that's what extraordinary care is. Now, I add on a very important feature that for a while there was unique to me, and that is that when you provide this extraordinary care, you create romantic love. And so there's a sense in which I would argue that romantic love is the outcome of extraordinary care when it's expressed correctly. And so I put a great deal of emphasis on romantic love. The bullet line for the new book that I'm writing, the rewrite of His Needs, Her Needs, will not be building an affair-proof marriage. It'll be making romantic love last. That's the bullet line. Now, most of the book is the same, but you do essentially the same thing. When you, when you meet emotional needs for each other, you're making the romantic love that you had when you first married last throughout the full extent of the marriage. This year, Joyce and I have been married 58 years, as you've mentioned. We've been in love with each other throughout those entire 58 years. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, we are deeply in love with each other. We have uh, feelings for each other that are the same as we had when we were dating. And the, and the point is that you can, everybody can do it. It isn't, it isn't that hard to do, but you have to understand what to do. Well, and that was one of the, the things I do want to talk about what to do. But you had mentioned when we talked that that romantic love, maintaining that romantic love is so key because, as you said, nobody gets divorced if they're in love with each other. Mm. And that's just such a key. Do you want to expound upon that a little bit? Well, oh, yeah, well, the, 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 this was a discovery that I made when I was trying to figure out how to save marriages. And I was in California at the time when uh, in the 1960s, where uh, divorce rates went from 10 percent at the beginning of that decade to 40 uh, percent by the end of the decade. And then it went to 50 percent by 1980. And my problem was I was seeing marriages just dissolve. And the question was, what could I do to save marriages? So I had to pay a whole lot of attention to marriages that are, were really healthy and happy. And uh, it was hard for me to figure out exactly what the formula was until I recognized that, hey, you know, if you're in love, who in their right mind would want to get a divorce? And so I started thinking about, okay, what can I do to create romantic love for people? More importantly, how can I help couples sustain it. They get married because they're in love and they get divorced because they're not in love. And uh, for many people, to me, <laughs> that answer, which seemed ridiculous, I mean, why would anybody divorce and, and send their children to the wind uh, and create all kinds of problems for all sorts of people? Divorce just because they weren't in love. And yet I had people telling me that. I lost my love. We must not be right for each other. I think I will find somebody else that I can be in love with. And I said, well, what if you could be in love with your spouse? How would you feel about saving your marriage then? Well, Dr. Harley, you know, if I could be in love with my spouse, I'd probably want to stay married to her. But I don't think you can do that. I said, well, why don't we try? You just do what I tell you to do. More importantly, I'm going to tell your wife what to do. And then we're going to see how this turns out. So I had enough people agree with me that, okay, it's worth a try. I, you know, I, I think... Doors would be hard on my children. I grant you that. So let's give it a shot. So I gave them assignments of romantic dating. They had to, they, a minimum of 15 hours a week, giving each other their undivided attention, meeting each other's most important emotional needs. And for many people, within a, within a matter of two or three months, 
They were in love. No talk about divorce anymore. And so having those experiences back in the in the late 60s, early 70s convinced me this should be my career. I, I should do this as a job. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist. I can do a lot of things. But my feeling was the most important thing I could probably do for couples, for people, is to help people stay married. More importantly, to have happy marriages. And you do that by doing what it takes to stay in love with each other. Well, and that's basically what your book teaches, right? And I know you said the new one's coming out in February, correct? Because you're changing a little bit of the language, making it a little, you said you found that the needs have evolved a little. I think the book, does the book help people identify what those needs are? Yeah, I, I put a, a little less emphasis on the need being a male need and a female need. What I say is that that basically you have to tell me what your needs are. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what your needs are. I still am convinced that most men's top five emotional needs are um, sexual fulfillment, which is usually at the top, recreational companionships, um, physical attractiveness, um, domestic support and admiration. And for most women, the top five is affection, intimate conversation, honesty and openness, family commitment, and financial support. Now, things have changed a lot in our culture. Then the question is, do people really feel that these things are the same? And I say, well, for each person has to decide for themselves. So I wrote the book with a lot less emphasis on his need or her need. Uh, so for example, the subtitle uh, that got me into all kinds of trouble um, was um, recreational companionship, he needs a playmate. Okay, people didn't like that. And so we just left that subtitle off altogether, <laughs> you know, and, and also that um, all, all the other subtitles, they're all very sexist. So we just let them, okay, we don't have any more subtitles. And in the chapter, I point out the fact that the opposite sex could have the same need. And many people come to me saying that they feel that my order is wrong. So I, I, I soft pedal the order. People can choose what they want. The point is, what makes you the happiest? You pick from this list. And, and if your spouse does that for you, you're going to be in love with them. Well, and then you talk and, and one of your great inventions of this in your book that is just gold standard. I mean, as you like read different marriage ministry things, you know, from from the 80s till now, so many people have in, incorporated your ideas in what they're talking about. But you talked about the love bank. Could you tell us what the love bank is? People may be nodding their heads going, oh, I've heard of the love bank. But could you explain what that is? Because that kind of has, talks about the positive part with the needs and also the negative part with the, the love busters. Yeah, so I come from a behavioral background in, in my education. And um, you can think of the Pavlov dog as an example of an early, an early effort on the part of some people to explain the, the connection between things emotionally. Um, the dog, when he is um, uh, shocked uh, with something, re 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 finds it repulsive. And when he it gets food, when he then then he finds it attractive. You can think of a yourself that when you see the color blue, um, everything you get relaxing music. But when the color red shows up, you get an electric shock. You get to a point where you don't like the color red anymore, and you think the color blue is great. So I, you know, I use that kind of concept to help people understand how they could be attractive to. Uh, how other people could be attractive to them or repulsive to them. If the person does something to make them happy, they are going to find that person attractive. If the person does something to make them unhappy, they're going to find that person repulsive. So I put all that together and I try to use the concept that will help them see how everything they do affects each other when they're married. And I use the love bank. The love bank is a situation where I, I feel that when your 
spouse makes you happy, uh, love units are deposited in their account in your love bank. And when you make your spouse happy, love units are deposited in, 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 in your account in their love bank. So the basic idea is that you're either making love bank deposits or you're making love bank withdrawals. So how do you make the most love bank deposits? You make them by meeting each other's most important emotional needs. What makes you the happiest when your spouse is doing something for you? That's what makes the most love bank deposits. Now, what a phenomenon that I recognized uh, when I started working on this was the concept of a, um, of, of, a, of a level of deposits that trigger something very special. And I, I consider it, you breach the romantic love threshold when you've made enough deposits so you have a certain number of deposits and when that happens a phenomenon called romantic love is triggered romantic love is unmistakable to people that have experienced it it is a feeling of incredible attraction to somebody who has reached the romantic love threshold so what i want to do is train people in how to do that how can you make your spouse love you? And I and I believe that that is possible. Your spouse cannot make themselves love you. You have to make your spouse. You have to make your spouse love you by meeting your spouse's emotional needs. As soon as people got that idea with a love bank, and of course, as in the case of bank accounts, you can you can have not just deposits, but you can have withdrawals, and you can be in the red, and you can have withdrawn so many love units that you are now in a serious state of deficit. As a matter of fact, there is what I consider to be the hate threshold down there someplace, where if enough love units get withdrawn, you can actually find the person so incredibly uh, disgusting that you don't want to have anything to do with them, which is common in marriage. Because if you can't get away from somebody who's making all these love bank withdrawals, sooner or later, you're going to come to hate them. So you have to pay attention to making deposits, but you also have to pay attention to not making withdrawals. And when people kind of get that idea, it's an easy idea to understand. Then when you look at the person, you think to yourself, am I making a deposit or am I making a withdrawal? And you want, to, you want them to tell you. I want my wife to tell me when I'm doing things that make her happy and when I'm doing things that make her unhappy. I encourage complaining. Why? Because I want to know what, my account in her love bank is looking like. It's just like my bank account. I like to look at my bank account every once in a while. I want to know what my account in her love bank looks like. And the only way I can do that is to have her tell me. She has to tell me. And, and it's in the form of feedback, letting me know whether I'm making deposits or withdrawals. Well, and I, I thought was so interesting as we were talking about this, that the whole withdrawal or your love bank is doing this unconsciously. Yes. Like you can't force your love bank or try to control your own love bank. It is truly how your spouse is, is reacting to you. It's generating your emotional response and you can't just run that up. So I just thought that was really interesting because maybe you're like, you're saying, oh, I don't want to be irritated with my husband, but it's still making a withdrawal from your love bank, even if you're not wanting to participate in that. So I, th I thought that was really interesting that it's the love bank is, is in your emotions and not controllable. Yeah. And, and your, and your husband needs to know that he's making the withdrawals. Now, a lot of men that I counsel, they don't want to know. They say, you know, I, one of the worst things that you can have in, in life is a complaining wife, because if, if you hear all these complaints all the time, it just makes you miserable. And, and that's no way to be uh, married. I take the opposite position. I say the most important thing in life is feedback. Uh, we need to get back. We need to get information about all sorts of things as to how well things are turning out. In general, in our marriage, we need to get that kind of feedback from our spouse on a moment-to-moment -moment -moment basis. Now, most men will look at me and say, "You got to be crazy to encourage your wife to complain." And I have to say that it doesn't hurt me one single bit. It doesn't upset me. It doesn't make me mad. Uh, what I do is I look at her feedback and I say, okay, I'm, if I'm making 
love bank withdrawals in this area, and it's usually I'm annoying her, okay? I mean, this is the problem that men have in marriage, and that is that men tend to be annoying. So you need to know what it is you're doing that happens to be annoying. And then, and then first of all, you recognize, okay, this is a mistake. I shouldn't be doing this. Even if it's a totally un unintentional, it's not something I do on purpose. I, I just have this habit. Should I put some effort and energy into doing something that avoids my spouse finding me annoying? Absolutely. And more importantly, I can do it. I can actually do it. And it is an act of care. It's all part of extraordinary care for me not to be an annoying husband, which is quite a challenge, I must admit. <laughs> well, I think you must be doing something right after 58 years. I like to, we talked about the the love bank um, being something, your first, like you said, the first book was the tagline was the affair proof marriage. And now you've changed that into more of the, the romantic love. But you talked, you said you revised the new book that that's coming out to really talk about guarding your emotional love bank and, and the responsibility for both spouses to not provide an opportunity for an affair to start. Could you talk a little, because that's kind of one of the newer uh, things that you found. There's a new chapter entitled Guarding Your Love Bank from Outside Threats. And the basic idea is that you can fall in love with anybody. Anybody that happens to meet, you meet your most important emotional needs, your, your love bank it does not show discrimination. Your love bank doesn't say, you know, uh, Bill, you're supposed to be in love with your wife, so uh, we're just going to close the account of this other person over here that you've happened to find attractive doesn't work that way. The the love bank says, you know, here's somebody over here that's making deposits. Bill, you should notice this. Notice notice that all these deposits are being made. And uh, so my job as a husband has been to recognize that there are certain things that Joyce does that really make me happy, that cause me to be in love with her. I have to avoid putting myself in a position where some other woman could do the same thing. And so um, from the beginning of our marriage, I was aware of the fact that an affair would be a possibility and it would be a disaster. And so I took what I call extraordinary precautions. Um, in this chapter, I use uh, guarding my love bank from outside threats. That's a basic C, the same thing. I don't let women make massive love bank deposits the way I let Joyce make massive love bank deposits. So you could argue that there is a way in which you do make it easier for your spouse to make those deposits and you make it harder for other people to make the same deposit. So to some extent, I do have some control over who I'm going to be in love with, but it's my spouse that has to be making those deposits. And if my spouse isn't making those deposits, there is not much I can do about being in love with this person that I have committed myself to for life. Yeah. Well, and I, I thought that was really interesting about how especially you've added the new chapter, but you've also added the responsibility for from both spouses. Whereas, you know, back in the 80s, it, you know, it might have been more one sided. But in, in, but now really charging as, as people are out in the workplace. I know you do a lot of new research with millennials that you're seeing that there's opportunities on both for both spouses to really guard their love bank and to guard their heart. What else have you found out from millennials? I know you've been doing some research with them. Well, one of the big questions that comes up a lot is, uh, is the meeting of an emotional need a responsibility or a gift? Mm -hmm. um, people have told me that they consider the meeting of an emotional need as a gift. And they don't like the fact that I express it as a responsibility that when I married Joyce, I promised to meet her emotional needs. She promised to meet my emotional needs. So that, that, that sounds like a responsibility. Yeah. Well, uh, millennials don't like the concept as well. So what I've done is I've said, uh, which is true, that meeting an emotional need is a responsibility, but it's also a gift. From the perspective of the person receiving the emotional need, it should be a gift. Yeah. 
So when Joyce meets my emotional need, I, I have to think in my mind, this is not something that she's supposed to do. This is something that she does because she cares about me. It's her gift to me. She does the same thing. Uh, that argument, which seems irrational, I mean, how can it be both a gift and a responsibility, seems to work. Uh, in other words, that if you see what your spouse is doing for you as a gift, you will appreciate what they do for you, and you will tell them you appreciate it. Uh, if you think of it as a responsibility, you're less likely to appreciate it. So I like, I like the concept of the gift. But at the same time, in marriage, there are certain things that if you don't do those things for each other, you leave your spouse hung out to dry. They, they have no other ethical ways of achieving that objective of meeting that emotional need. So on the one hand, I think it's a contract. It's something you've agreed to do. Do it. Make sure you enjoy doing it. But at the same time, it's a responsibility. From your spouse's perspective, I want your spouse to think of it as your gift to your spouse that you do out of the goodness of your heart. You know, you have been doing Marriage Builders Radio five days a week for a long time. And it is one of your resources that's found right there on your website, correct? MarriageBuilders.com? Yep. Which which you just told me your resources are translated through Google Translate into 140 languages. Through so, Google Translate. Google Translate does it all. Uh, it's just a little button you push at the bottom of the page. You, you put in the language you want the page to be translated in, and Zippo, there it is in whatever language you want. So every page on our website can be translated into any language um, uh, as long as Google Translate works on it, and it's free of charge. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feature that, that is just amazing to me. And uh, I encourage people from all over the world to look at our website, not as a website that has to be read in English, but a website that can be read in any language. And now your radio, uh, your radio shows, are they, are they available there as well? That if people want to listen to them while they're, you know, taking a walk or doing their yard work, they can, they can access and hear some of those too? We have an app, uh, the uh, Marriage Builders Radio app, which is downloadable free of charge on your on your cell phone, and um, you can um, look. You can you can get the the radio show from the from the top, and um, every day it's different, and uh, it's at two two o'clock in the afternoon. Basically, a new show always comes up. And the, the date of the show, if we run a best of the date, you'll see the date. It's an older show. If you want the date that happens today, it'll show today's date there. Now, our radio show is not translated <laughs> into 140 languages. Someday, maybe, you know, we can have translations of, of, of podcasts. But I think right now, you, you got you to gotta listen to it in English. And you do that show with your wife, correct? She's the she's the uh, uh, she's the uh, director. She is the producer. Uh, she is the host, and I am the guest. I and, love that. Any love any particular that. themes in the last few minutes that you've been seeing, maybe recently that have been trending? We do a lot on the topic of anger. Anger is a big deal. It comes up a lot, uh, and and infidelity is is also a big issue that comes up a lot. We. The, the, the question of care is, is important. Um, why, how, how, how do you express your care in a way that your spouse knows you care? Mm -hmm. And my argument is always, if you do things that make your spouse the happiest, they will conclude that you care. But you can really care from your heart and be missing the target. And then your spouse concludes that you don't care. So we get a lot of questions of, I don't think my spouse cares about me. And, and we try to help the spouse do things a little differently to express that care in a way that gets across the way they should, the way it should be getting across. We handle it just about anything, child rearing, in-laws, um, drugs, all kinds of problems. Well, and that brings us full circle to where we started, where the people's needs 
are not all the same. They're those 10 basic needs and figuring out which ones are important to your spouse and needing them and then figuring out which ones are important to you and helping your spouse. If your spouse doesn't know that you know you want them to spend time with you, then how do they do that? So that importance of that communication. But thank you so much, Dr. Harley. It has been such a pleasure. You have been just a, an icon for so long and really one of my great heroes. I remember my small group uh, did your book back in the 90s when my husband and I were, were not quite as long in tooth. And uh, that was a good foundation uh, for our marriage that has now been 26 years. So I thank you so much. Well, it's for being been my here. pleasure. It's been my pleasure, Amy. Oh, and if y'all want to connect with uh, the San Antonio Marriage Initiative, you can find us at samarriage.org. Thank you so much.